Please welcome Dr. Wayne Hawkins with our opening remarks. Hello, and welcome to the 2023 Sue Salthouse Memorial Lecture. My name is Wayne Hawkins, and until very recently, I was the director of inclusion at ACAN, now retired. Firstly, I would like to acknowledge Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the traditional owners of the lands and waters of Australia and pay respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. ECAN holds this annual event as a way to celebrate Sue Salthouse's life and achievements as a disability advocate. As many of you know, Sue was a strong disability advocate across many areas, including access to telecommunications for people with disability. Sue was a longtime member and friend of ACAN and was on ACAN's inaugural board of directors. Sue also was chairperson of ACAN's board for two years. And it was during this time that I got to meet and work with Sue on ACAN's Standing Advisory Committee for Disability Issues. And it was in this work that I got to see firsthand Sue's enthusiasm, generosity, and dedication to effective advocacy. We also use this event as a way to spotlight women with disability in leadership roles, as a way to highlight the importance of strong disability advocacy and the strong voices of women with disability in the community. This year, we're very fortunate to have Emma Benison to deliver the lecture. Emma Benison, as many of you will know, is also a strong disability advocate and has had a number of leadership roles improving the lives of people with disability in Australia, particularly in her role as CEO of Arts Access Australia, and more recently as her role as CEO of Blind Citizens Australia. Uh, we got to work together uh, when Emma was the BC BCA CEO, and ACAN and BCA had a lot of common interests, and we worked together, particularly in areas such as improving access to audio description on television for people with disability, specifically people who are blind or vision impaired. The team at ACAN is particularly thrilled to have Emma deliver the 2023 Sue Salthouse Memorial Lecture, and I hope you will welcome me in giving Emma a warm virtual welcome as she delivers the presentation from her home in Hobart. Thank you, Emma. Please welcome our Sue Salthouse Memorial Lecturer for 2023, Emma Benison. Good afternoon, everyone. It's fantastic to be with you this afternoon and thank you so much to Wayne for that lovely introduction. Really appreciate that. I'd like to um, add my acknowledgement of the traditional custodians of the various lands that we're meeting on today and to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I'm in Nipaluna today and I'd like to acknowledge uh, the, the people of Nipaluna before I begin. It's a real honour to be speaking to you today in memory of Sue Salthouse. I was fortunate enough to hear Sue speak on a number of occasions and was in various rooms with her on a number of occasions. But as so often happens um, for me as a blind person, it's very difficult to find people in large rooms. And so I never actually as far as I can recall, got the opportunity to connect with Sue. And I'm very sorry about that because um, I know from having heard about her legacy through um, 
other people and and also through what's been written about Sue uh, since her passing, that we would have had a huge amount in common. And I think we would have needed a lot of coffee um, if we'd caught up because, um, you know, Sue uh, was very passionate about ending violence against women, um, as, as I am, uh, women and girls. She was also really committed and passionate about people with disability having um, seats at the table and also having a voice at the table because we know that seats are not enough. We need to have a voice as well. And that's something I'm also very committed to and passionate about. And also, of course, Sue had a strong um, and enduring commitment to accessible communications, uh, as I do also. Um, and particularly, of course, given my work um, in relation to audio description, which I'll touch on a little bit more later. But today I want to talk to you about something a little bit controversial. Um, I want to talk to you about why or about the, the times that I've almost quit disability advocacy and what changed my mind. Um, now, you might say, well, that's a strange thing to want to talk about in a memorial lecture, but I do think that we often focus on the wins in advocacy. And I also think that some of the most instructive conversations that I've had with, um, with mentors and with fellow advocates has been about the times when things haven't gone so well. They're the conversations I've often learnt most from because it's reminded me that I'm not the only person who's failed as an advocate. So I want to tell you a couple of or a few stories today about the times when things haven't necessarily gone quite so well um, and what I've learned from them and then why I've decided to keep advocating, what's kept me going. And hopefully that will help you to maintain your energy for advocacy because let's face it, advocacy can often be pretty um, tiring, pretty exhausting. Often it can be pretty thankless. Um, we hear about the wins, but we don't hear about the time and energy and just hard slog that goes into it. Um, and it can just be really time consuming. It can take years and years to get an outcome. So so why, why on earth does anybody keep doing it? Um, obviously, the short answer is because we love it and it's a calling for most of us. Um, but I just want to tell you a few stories about some of these times when it has been challenging and how I've um, recovered and what I've learned and then give you something to take away about how you can maintain your energy for advocacy. So the first story I want to tell you is about a time when I was abandoned, left behind, forgotten, whatever you want to call it, by an airline um, in one of Australia's largest airports. Uh, it was on International Day of People with Disability, which really rubs salt into the wound. And it was a really scary um, experience because not only did I get left behind, but I then kind of got forgotten about um subsequently and had to continue to advocate to get on a, a another flight. And so I often in those situations tend to use writing as a way to deal with some of those situations when it's sometimes can be quite traumatic and quite um, emotionally jarring. And, you know, when you get left behind by an airline, one thing you have a lot of is time. And so I had plenty of time to sit down and, and write about my experience. And I thought long and hard and I decided um, to publish what I'd written, uh, an opinion piece. And so I did that and I got lots of really strong support from my community. I was CEO of Blind Citizens Australia at the time, the National Representative Organisation of Australians who are blind or vision impaired. And, you know, it was a, a, a really great, level of outpouring of support. But I also um, heard from some people in my community who really made it clear to me in the nicest possible way that they felt that I should not have used my leadership position as CEO of Blind Citizens Australia um, to, you know, progress my individual advocacy issue. Now, 
I really respected some of these people. One of the reasons they said this was because, you know, there was a potential that the airline could be a future sponsor of the organisation. So, you know, that could disrupt that relationship. But also because um, they felt that, you know, I shouldn't be using my position. I should be um, representing the community and not um, and not progressing my own agenda. Now, I I thought about this a lot. I was um, speaking a lot with other advocates about this who I respected, and I reached the view that if you feel able to do so, when you hold a position of leadership, it really is incumbent upon you to use that position to um, advocate for systemic change. Now, I was the person being left behind on that particular day, but it could have been anybody else on any other given day. And I know many people who've been abandoned by airlines. Um, so I feel that you, if you have a platform like that, if you have the privilege to lead, you really need to use that platform to create change. Otherwise, I actually think that you're complicit in perpetuating the discrimination um, that we're all here to um, to remove. So, um, you know, that was a really difficult thing. Um, the second story I want to tell you um, is about a time when my I was working at Access Arts in Queensland, and I was going with my then boss, who was a wheelchair user to speak to the Brisbane City Council about a rental um, increase that they were imposing on us. And it was really going to put the organisation into jeopardy, financial dire straits. And so we went to speak to, to the council. When we got to the council chamber, turned out that the council chamber was actually inaccessible to my boss. He couldn't get in. Now, I was obviously incensed by this. And I said, well, what are we going to do? And I, I was agitating for me to go in and ask the councillors to come out and hear him speak. But he held the view that he didn't want to detract from the issue, the rental increase issue. And so he decided that what would actually happen is that I would go in and I would make the speech. Now, not only did that terrify me because I wasn't prepared to be speaking. I was just there to assist him. Um, but it also really upset me because I wanted him to have that opportunity and I wanted to really highlight the issue of the inaccessibility of the council chamber. But that was a real learning for me because I had to respect his position. I had to be an ally. Um, it didn't matter what opinion I had. Um, I, I really had to be... Um, an ally in that moment. And so that was a really good learning opportunity for me. And it really, but it really made me think about, well, you know, um, we, as advocates, we have to put our own opinions to one side sometimes. Um, the third story I want to tell you is um, about when my second child was born. I was... Um, uh, really unwell. She was a month early and so had to be um, taken to the neonatal intensive care unit. And it was a really difficult environment, um, apart from the fact that anyone who has a child has had a child in a neonatal intensive care unit will tell you it's it's very scary. But from an accessibility point of view, it was really difficult because um, they kept moving um, her to a to a different room each day, depending on her condition. So I never knew, and my husband, who is also blind, we never knew where she was going to be. And um, there were things like, you know, uh, we had to put the breast milk into bottles. We had to express it and label it. It was labeled in, in print. And so um, we really struggled to find um, our milk. And there were just all sorts of complex challenges, which I won't bore you with, but but really um, it, it got to a point where in order to take her home, I think she'd been in there for a, a, about a week, and in order to take her home, we the rule was that we had to prove that we could feed her, I could feed her independently um, for 24 hours on breast milk alone. 
And that was surprisingly challenging because of the, the reasons I've just mentioned. Um, and so eventually I decided that we needed to talk to the doctors and explain some of the challenges that were, were occurring here. Um, the problem was that the hospital had a policy that said that we could only speak to the doctors um, if somebody, well, it had to be me, was breastfeeding um, at the time. That was the only way we were allowed to stay in the room. And so I manufactured a situation where I was breastfeeding her simply so I could speak to the doctors. Now, this was a situation where I was really vulnerable and really distressed because of what had occurred and because I felt really um, inadequate as a parent in that moment. And so having that conversation with that doctor, it was probably one of the most difficult conversations I had ever had. And I think he probably took one look at me and went, oh God, she's really lost it. We better do something about this. And as it, as it turned out, um, we did get to take um, my daughter home. But the learning for me was that it took me a long time to recover from that. And actually, I was not the best person to be advocating for myself on that particular issue. Um, I really should have sought the help of an advocate. I, sh I really should have sought the help of an advocate to stand up to that policy um, so that we could have talked to the doctor um, with my husband and, you know, in a much more conducive environment. So that was a really difficult learning for me. And the final story I want to tell you um, is about um, a more recent experience I had when I got the opportunity to go and speak to the Department of Communications and the Arts. Uh, and I knew that the Deputy Secretary was going to be present. And I was um, invited to speak about um, audio description. It was during the time when we were trying to um, get audio description on Australian television. And I, I really um, prepared well for this presentation, I, you know, over many weeks because I knew how, I just had a feeling it was going to be important. Um, and it was lucky that I did prepare because the day before I got really, really sick. I got a terrible flu and, but I was absolutely determined that I was going to do this presentation. And so the next day um, I, I did do it and it and it went really well and I um it was certainly one of the factors one of many factors that played into um us successfully getting audio description on our public broadcasters but really the point about that is I couldn't have done that if I hadn't been as well prepared as I was it's so important to be prepared so that if you're not at your best on a given day, you can still do the advocacy that needs to be done. The more prepared you are, the less thrown you will be by things like, you know, if you can't get into the building easily or if the public transport has gone against you or, you know, the taxi hasn't turned up or whatever it is. So, um, you know, it's it's just really, really important Um to to be as prepared as you can be, and that was my learning from that particular um, that particular experience. So I guess the question is then, after hearing all of those kind of very different stories, why do I keep advocating? Because you know um, those and many others are examples of why sometimes it would be easier to to stop. Um, Emily. Uh, Esfahani Smith identifies four pillars of a meaningful life in her book about meaning. And when I, when I read this book, it really struck me that these are actually the four pillars that keep me and probably many other people um, advocating. And one is that advocacy really does create a sense of belonging. You know, there's, there's a real sense of belonging when you can work with um, your community and with other organisations to advocate, you know, for a common um, purpose. Uh, and so that's that's one of the things that keeps me doing it. The second one is actually a sense of purpose. There's nothing like having a sense of purpose to keep you advocating. You know, if you really are committed to, um, you know, upholding the human rights of people with disability, uh, there's nothing like that to, to give you purpose. And then the third one is storytelling. And I think storytelling is like advocacy is so much about storytelling, you know, whether it be that you're um, 
telling your own story or whether you've been given the really huge honor and privilege of um, providing a voice for someone else and sharing their story in the way that they want you to do that or whether it be that you're actually painting a picture of a brighter future through story you know everything in advocacy comes back to to story and then the final one is is transcendence and I think in this instance when I talk about transcendence I guess what I mean is um, you know transcending the kind of argumentative sort of um, approach that we traditionally tend to take to advocacy transcending the us and them and really trying to think about you know what is it that we want to achieve here and how can we bring people together rather than dividing people? So for me, those pillars have been really important. And my secret and what I really want to leave you with um, to, to kind of longevity and advocacy has been to develop my own advocacy style. You know, I don't want to advocate in an adversarial way. I mean, sometimes you have to be adversarial and that's fine. But for me, that's that's not the kind of advocacy I want to be doing most of the time. I want to advocate with, with kindness and compassion um, and truth-telling, you know, wherever I possibly can. Um, but you can do truth-telling in a, in a kind and compassionate way. It doesn't always work, but wherever I can, that's what I want to do. And I guess what I want to leave with you today is that you don't have to advocate like anyone else. Like you probably have many advocates that you admire, but that doesn't mean that you have to advocate like them. You need to figure out what your authentic advocacy style is. You need to figure out what works for you. And I think this is especially true for, for women. You know, you really have to decide who you want to be, how you want to show up. And I think it's it's so important the how you show up because it's what people remember about you. It's it's as much or more important than what you actually say um, is how you show up. So I would really challenge you to be intentional about that as much as you possibly can and to figure out what, what your own advocacy style is and um, to really own that and not to apologise for that um, because I think we need more advocates who are authentic and unique. So I will leave you with that and thank you again so much for the opportunity to speak to you today. Please welcome Kerry Marshall. Thank you very much, Emma, for your keynote speech. My name is Kerry Marshall, and I'm the former chair of Women with Disabilities ACT. During my time at WIDACT, I was lucky enough to work with Sue Soldhouse and witness firsthand just how passionate she was about advocating for policy reform to ensure access and equity for women with disabilities across multiple areas, including communications. It's not often that an advocate as passionate, articulate, wise and steadfast as Sue comes along. And I'm grateful to ACAN for giving me the opportunity to be part of celebrating Sue's legacy through these memorial lectures. An on-demand recording of this lecture will be available at a later date via acan.org.au. And I look forward to the opportunity to celebrate more of the work that's been accomplished in the field of disability and human rights at next year's Memorial Lecture. Thank you all for joining us today.